And today we'll have uh, Dr. Derek Izakowitz, an associate professor of psychology at Northeastern University, who will be speaking with us on emotion and attention. So he received his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, working with Dr. Martin Seligman, and his BA from Stanford University, working with Dr. Laura Carstensen. Dr. Zakowitz's research interests lie at the intersection of attention and emotion, particularly among older adults. He's received numerous honors, including the American Psychological Association Early uh, Career Award um, from Division 20, the Margaret M. and Paul B. Baltz Foundation Award in Behavioral and Social Gerontology for Outstanding Early Career Contributions from the Ger Gerontological Society of America, as well as several graduate mentoring and teaching awards. His research has been funded by grants from the NIH, and Dr. Zakowitz has served on the editorial boards of several renowned journals, including Psychology and Aging, Emotion, as well as the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. So I now turn to our experts in emotion interview with Dr. Derek Zakowitz. So welcome, Derek. Thanks for speaking with us today. Can, Derek, I wanted to start out just by asking you some questions about what first got you interested in emotion and at the very beginning. So I, I sort of discovered emotion as an undergraduate at Stanford, um, though I didn't come to it because of emo emotion per se. Mm -hmm. I actually uh, first got interested in the study of aging because I met Laura Karstensen, uh, really one of the world experts on the psychological study of aging, at a faculty dinner during my freshman year at Stanford. And because I thought she was really great and cool, I decided that I would start working in her lab. and. Um, I learned over the course of my time in the lab that what she was interested in was how um, social and emotional processes change with age. So that is how I ended up studying emotion. Um, and I feel very fortunate to have had that, uh, had that encounter because it wasn't that I initially had some big question about emotion I wanted to answer. It was that I was interested in aging and issues about emotion became really interesting and important to me in the context of aging. Wow, so the serendipitous discovery of emotion. Luckily serendipitous. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask you then a few questions about your research now that is focused on emotion and attention. Um, so I mean, you are widely known in the field for your work on attention and emotion and how this relationship can change through the lifespan. And I wondered from your perspective as an expert in this area, what do you see as the most important discoveries? To me, the most important uh, discoveries from my own area of research um, has been that something that we consider as, as sort of basic and fundamental as visual attention can really be flexible um, depending on things like what goals people are trying to pursue, um, as well as uh, that it may change over the course of development um, in ways that reflect shifting motivation and shifting goals. So I think for me, it's been most exciting to see, to try to understand differences between people of different ages in something as fundamental as visual attention and to be able to investigate to what extent those changes are a function of psychological changes and what's important to people, um, though it may of course have other, uh, have other causes as well. Um, so that to me has been very exciting, particularly in light of other research in other labs showing age differences and processing of emotional attention um, in other sorts of cognitive uh, sorts of tasks, like in memory tasks. And what do you see as some of the biggest challenges in this line of work, too? Well, I see two, two sort of big challenges. One is yeah. just the technical challenge of doing the sort of research I do using eye tracking to look at visual attention um, in populations like older adults. Uh, these technologies were not designed really to uh, for use in groups of people who whose eyes may uh, not have uh, typical features uh, that we would expect from uh, from younger adults who the systems were designed for. So there's the technical challenge of doing something like eye tracking to study attention in older people. And then there's the sort of pragmatic challenge of you know, the reason I'm interested in eye tracking with uh, older people is not just because I want to understand eye movements, but because I want to understand the cognitive processes that help people of different ages uh, regulate how they feel in real time. And so the other big challenge is that predicting how people feel in real time is really complicated. Um, I might be interested in attention as one predictor, but in the course of our everyday life, um, there are lots of things that happen that may or may not affect our mood in the short and long term. So it's been really challenging methodologically to be able to try to predict real-time mood change and how that varies by age. I think we're making progress, but it's been quite tricky. Well, all that being said, I mean, you do such sophisticated, beautiful work um, in spite of all the challenges that you're, you know, outlining right now. Um, I mean, and in that vein, 
you know, you've continued to do work really looking at how age-related changes in the relationship between attention and emotion shift across time. And I just wondered here, what you think research tells us about the sort of modifiability of attention as another important component of emotion regulation more generally? It's interesting. We initially started doing this work because of our interest specifically in age differences. But as we found patterns of age differences that suggested that the ways in which individuals use their attention to regulate their emotion changes with age, it raised very, what I think are natural questions about the extent to which we can through time or through intervention, change our attention in a way that might influence emotion regulation. If that happens naturally with age, it makes sense to ask how that might happen in other formats as well. And so this has led, I think, quite naturally to us thinking about things like, for example, meditation. Um, students in my lab who are more, have more direct experience than I do always tell me that you know, one of the main reasons that people are interested in meditation is because they believe that in uh, that they can use techniques of meditation to help train their attention because they think that that will improve their well-being. And so that's sort of an implicit belief about being able to train attention for emotion regulation. So I see a lot of parallels between what we can learn about aging and age differences and how people use attention to regulate their emotions and something like meditation where people are intentionally trying to right change their attention to regulate emotion. I think there are a lot of parallels and a lot of lessons uh, between those two areas in terms of what's possible and also what's not going to be possible in terms of changing attention uh, for emotion regulation. I mean, in speaking of parallels, you've also written about these parallels between aging and disorders of emotion. So you've written a nice review looking at the relationship between positivity biases in both you know, aging or older adults as well as individuals with a history of mania or bipolar disorder. And in what ways can we really see sort of parallels as well as possible differences between these two kind of fundamentally different groups of people. Yeah, this, that project yeah. really started as a thought experiment and it mostly <laughs> continues as a thought experiment. Yeah. Because I think in the aging area, it's become so widely accepted that older adults show positivity in their emotional processing and in their experience that it's, it, there hasn't been much of a dialogue with other areas in which people talk about positivity biases. So I thought it would be useful to think about parallels, similarities, and differences with other areas. So that got me in discussions with people studying bipolar disorder. And you know, clearly, what we our starting point was that here are two groups of people, older people uh, and people with, uh, with bipolar disorder, who were thought to have some sort of positive offset in some aspect of their experience and or their regulation and or their processing of emotional information. So we said, well, how are these offsets explained uh, in the literature? What are the conceptual models? And what do we know empirically about, uh, about that? And it turns out that you know, it's quite hard to make any definitive conclusions because in large part, the methods that are used in one field have not been translated to the other. So for example, um, apparently I've learned from, uh, from colleagues in this area that there are numerous studies in the bipolar, bipolar literature on goal frustration. And we don't have any of those in the aging literature, but it would be a really good thing for somebody to do. Um, so we've been limited by the lack of sort of formal parallels in, in research. Um, it, it, for me, it was mostly interesting to think about um, you know, we have a tendency to interpret older adults' positivity as a great thing, um, and uh, and clearly that's not the case in, in bipolar. And, and even though it's sort of a, maybe a trite conclusion, I think it's an important conclusion that our interpretation of these positivity offsets is no doubt influenced by our expectations. And if we really want to understand sort of group differences from uh, from not from neutral, negative, or positive responding, then we sort of need a conceptual framework that allows us to consider when it's adaptive and when it's not adaptive. There may or may not be um, interesting differences and or similarities in neural pathways. I don't think we're at that point yet in neural processes, but um, I think it will be interesting for us to keep up with over the years to see if the literature do become more parallel um, because they can instruct each other about what, uh, what makes sense and what doesn't. Yeah, and I mean, in terms of the literature's kind of instructing each other, I wonder if you think either of these literatures separately or when sort of put side by side can tell us anything about, you know, potential interventions to promote well-being more generally or individually in each of these two populations, older adults and individuals with a history of mania. Well, you know, one thing that I do think is suggested by the literature to this point, and it may just be an artifact of what's been studied, 
Let's say the most consistent findings of in the aging literature are, are not about enhanced positivity per se, but more about reduction in negativity, which does not, in my reading, seem to be the case in the bipolar literature. So, I, so my belief is that if that pans out as a meaningful distinction in the two, uh, the two research areas, then it may be that the aging literature is going to have more implications for intervention for reducing negative affect, whereas the bipolar literature will have more implications for interventions that could ramp down on problematic positive affect. Um, that said, I mean, when people ask me about interventions from the aging literature, it's always tricky. My usual response is, well, what the literature suggests is the best intervention is to just wait. <laughs> <laughs> Sort of the, the, the positive effects of time to uh, to take shape, and, and it's only sort of half joking. I mean, I do think that that's one one possible lesson. I mean, the meditation parallel is one way that we try to flesh out what the shorter term implications might be, other than than waiting. But that is sort of one implication, I think, of the aging literature. Excellent. I mean, thank you so much for answering all these questions about kind of how you serendipitously got into the field of motion and how you've been kind of stuck ever since, you know, unraveling these mysteries about attention and emotion across the lifespan. So the question I have for you now is, all of that, that aside, where do you see the future of the field headed? Sort of where is it going from here? I mean, my, and this is maybe just my hope, but my, my expectation um, is that we'll start to see uh, a better integration across various levels of analysis in, in emotion research. Um, and to me, levels of analysis certainly includes the usual suspects of levels of analysis like biological, neural, behavioral, social, but it also includes sort of a wider net um, of things like, you know, th that are interesting to me, like, like age differences, cultural differences, um, because you know the, we have so many great researchers in different areas of emotion focusing on one aspect, one one of these levels of analysis, either going deep or wide, and um, and eventually the hope is that we'll all come together. And I think that people are starting to bridge maybe two two uh, areas, but I'm I'm optimistic that there's going to be work that really goes uh, goes both broader and wider within particular questions. And what we're seeing, I think, is that one barrier to that is different terminology, different operational definitions. So I'm hopeful that we can at least cross, get get past those uh, those problems and obstacles to have more common definitions and constructs that will then allow us to take a broader view. But that's what, that's what I hope for. That's excellent. And so when you think about where you hope the future of the field in emotions going, and you have students coming to you who are interested in embarking in this field, uh, what kind of advice do you give them? Yeah, my main advice is that, and this is clearly um, rooted in my own experience, is that you know emotion is such a rich area, it's such a hot area. I think it's a great area for students to be in. But I always suggest to students that they make sure to have a thing, um, a, a particular issue, topic, um, eight, whether age group, disorder, some lens through which to view emotion. Because I think for somebody who's just interested in emotion in general, it's so vast um, and it can be hard to ground one's thinking um, in, in the literature and the tradition and the history. So I always suggest to students that they start with one, with one perspective. Again, it could, in my lab, it would be age differences, but in another lab, it could be a disorder or it could be some sort of cultural difference or it could be one particular flavor of emotion. Um, but just to have some lens in which to, to view things, because then as you expand out, you have some sort of basic understanding that you take with you. So for me, you know, I was initially interested in aging, so I learned all about that, um, and, and it clearly was the lens with which I thought about emotion. But then, you know, in my, in sort of another serendipitous experience, the reason that I ended up doing eye tracking was not because somebody in the aging literature suggested it, but because an anxiety researcher suggested it as we were talking about, um, about issues. They said, well, you know, in anxiety, people are using eye tracking. And I thought, well, my, maybe we could use that in aging. And it turned out to, to work out really well. And I think that if I hadn't had already been grounded in a question where I felt like I had mastered a one perspective on the literature, I wouldn't have been as open and amenable to trying to integrate then across different literatures and try something that was sort of out, out of the box. So I, I think that you know, these sort of um, cross-cutting approaches, it, it may seem like I'm contradicting myself, but I think that you need some rooting in a basic perspective to then be ready and able to do work that sort of says, I have this perspective, I'm gonna try to break it up a little bit. Um, so that, anyway, that's the advice that I, that I would give. That's fantastic advice, Derek. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's been great to talk to you. And this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Derek Zakowitz from Northeastern University.